respect of offers and contracts. Now a state agent who has a mandate to sell or purchase immovable property shall willfully fail to present to the seller or purchaser concerned any offer to purchase or sell such property received prior to the conclusion of a contract of sale in respect of such property unless the seller or purchaser, as the case may be, has instructed him expressly not to present such an offer. If a seller tells you, I just want a cash offer, and if you look through a house, I've got a similar property like that, I know for sure the bank is not going to accept a bond on that property. It's not going to give a bond. There's no waste. Only a cash bar. What is the, why will you then waste your time and effort in taking a client out there that wants to apply maybe for a 100% bond? And also, you're not allowed actually to take such an offer to the own seller because he instructed you he doesn't want it and that there is significant reason for that. Any questions to this? Okay, who has a mandate? Oh no, why did I go up? Sorry, sorry for this. Okay, who has a mandate to sell immovable property? My present competenting offers to purchase the property in such a manner as to induce the seller to accept any particular offer without regard to the advantages or disadvantages of each offer for the seller. So, for in case, um, if you get an offer, now you actually play your own clients off against each other. So the one offer will be maybe 850, the other one will be 900, the other one will be 950, but maybe the 851 is the best offer uh, taking in consideration its cash and then the 950 is 100% bond. So it's not necessarily that the price determines the best offer. It is also, you know, how what is the deposits, what is the uh, uh, criteria that uh, we do a TPN on them, them, the bond originator can do a full credit check on them. So that is all uh, factors that you take in uh, consideration when you decide which offer is the best one for the seller. You will stop me if you've got any questions, please. No agent shall amend any provision of a signed offer prior to rejection thereof or a written mandate or any contract of sale or lease without the knowledge and express consent of the offerer or the parties to the contract as the case may be. Um, I just want to mention here that, um, sorry, if you take an offer in from a client, uh, from a, a, a purchaser, there is a clause to say before what time must the um, seller accept that offer. That offer, if it's signed with a date in, and it must all there must always be a date in. Uh, when I'm doing the practical on the offers tomorrow, I will uh, uh, tell you exactly why. So you, before that time, you are not allowed to make any uh, changes on that contract. Also, if you do make a change, you have to write next to that change the date of that change and every other part is must sign next to it. I know it's something that our agents um, doesn't really do and um, I don't know if you, they don't get training to do so, but that is actually the law to say that with any changes after signature, you have to in, sign initial and the time and date because that date then become the effective date. An estate agent shall explain to every prospective party to any written offer or contract negotiated 
or procured by him in his capacity as an estate agent prior to signature thereof by such party the meaning and consequences of the material provisions of such offer or contract or if he is unable to do so refer such party to a person who can do so and this is actually very very important this is one of the clauses that can lead either the seller or the purchaser to cancel a contract and then you as an estate agent can be in trouble is you are not actually allowed to email an offer to purchase to any party you must go there personally and make sure that they understand every clause in that contract and when will the monies be paid how will it be paid and any suspensive condition that's in the contract you have to explain to them how does it work and what is expected of each party any questions to this one no questions if he knows that an offer submitted by him as an estate agent to any party has been accepted or has not been accepted by the expiry date thereof forthwith notify the offerer of such fact you must always keep in touch with both of your clients either the seller or your purchaser uh, they must know exactly when what will happen without undue delay furnish every contracting party with a copy of an agreement of sale lease option or mandate with which he is concerned as an estate agent provided that a foregoing shall also apply in respect of an offer to purchase or lease if the offerer specifically requests a copy thereof. Now, there is a clause in, I think is a contract law um, that states, and this was in the old contract, uh, old laws in 1980, um, I think it's 86, somewhere there, to say that actually if any of the parties does not receive a copy of the contract within seven days, they can cancel that lead contract because then they do not know what's in that contract. They sign a document that they don't know what they've signed. So it is important that the moment that the offer is accepted, email each party a copy of that offer to purchase so that they know what it's what they've signed for and what is the time frame of the offer to purchase. Any questions? Activity. Uh, now this is a group activity. Now this is um, Martha Joyce. And um, Tandi, uh, you will be divided into groups, and then you must do this activity in a group activity. Uh, there is three questions. You can decide: is are you going to uh, divide the questions, or are you going to do it together? But in your portfolio, you must answer all three questions, and you can use each other's information to answer that question. Okay, from which, sorry, I didn't get that uh, correctly, Rina. Okay, you will be divided into groups. Uh, Bridget oh. will do it. She will put it for you on our main WhatsApp group. Uh, but how this is working, you will see some activities will be individual activities. Okay. And some activities is group activities. Now, we've divided oh. you into three people into one group. Okay. Yeah. So you work right. together in the group and you work this activity out and you submit. It will be the same answers uh, for each one of you. You will submit it into your portfolio. Okay. All right. Okay. Huh. In your groups, discuss the following questions. Which documents must the agent discuss with the prospective buyer and does he not have to explain? And is an estate agent obliged to inform a prospective buyer upfront on his percentage commission? Motivate your answer. 
as an estate agent, obliged to go back to his prospective buyer to tell him if his offer on a property has been rejected. Motivate your answer. Let's do uh, question three together. Um, who will take a shot on this one? And please don't be shy. I'm going to take a shot at this one. Um, question one, which document must the agent discuss with a prospective buyer? We just said nines the offer to purchase. Number two, is an estate agent obliged to inform the buyer his percentage? No. Um, um, as it is, uh, I, I think question I think three it's, is... It is, yeah, it's a is. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is an estate agent obliged to um, to go back to a prospective buyer to tell him if the offer has been uh, rejected? Yes. Yes, I, I agree with you because if it's rejected, uh, you will look for what reason has it been rejected and maybe you can uh, come up with a plan or renegotiate uh, either the the buyer can go up a little bit and the seller can, can come down a little bit. So you can negotiate that offer till it's accepted. Yes. And the percentage commission motivate your answer. Why will you say um, is the state agent not obliged to tell the buyer about his percentage commission? I, I feel as if the buyer would, um, he doesn't want to take care of the commission. Um, he feels that it will be too much um, for the asking price. I think that's what buyers feel. Um, therefore, the, the percentage commission is discussed with the seller. I agree because the your commission has the, already uh, been negotiated with the seller on the mandate and the seller is paying you your commission, not the buyer. Correct. Okay. Duty to the, of disclose individual activity. So this is an individual activity. An estate agent has a mandate to sell a house. Adjacent to the property, there, are, there is a large vacant site, but the estate agent being new to the area is unaware that a large shopping complex is being planned for the site. The estate agent introduces a prospective purchaser to the property, but fails to disclose the proposed development to the purchaser. Had the estate agent made superficial inquiries by, for example, telephoning the local authority, he could easily have ascertained the necessary facts. And I must say, this local authority, not in COVID and not in 20. <laughs> you won't get an answer. Okay. Would the agent have a legal duty to, to disclose in such a case or was he purely neglectant? If applicable, which clause is the agent in breach of? Somebody going to try to take a shot? Cabela, think of your development land in Kalina. Is he not there? Divakatsu? Rina, it's Alex. Can I take a sh another shot on this? Yes, 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 please. Um, Anything not disclosed with a prospective buyer by the agent is um, is uh, negligent. So I would say that um, the agent is not acting on behalf of the pr uh, prospective buyer because he's afraid that it might send the buyer or turn the buyer away. So therefore he does not disclose this and I believe it's pure negligence. But... Which clause in the is the agent in breach of if you take an offer to purchase? Okay, that's uh, kind of escaping my mind right now. <laughs> 
there is no clause to say that the agent must. Uh, this, I feel, is um, a very risky uh, statement because if the, the purchaser wants to go to court for incas, let's throw it around to a court case. Yeah. If the purchaser wants to go to court, what is he going to use against the agent? And if my I wish... Hmm? Okay. Sorry, please finish. No, no, so you can finish. Um, I'm putting myself in the shoes of the buyer. Yeah. If I were going to buy a, um, a place and right next door something is going to be built, I need to be. I need to think of all the um, the the discomfort, the inconvenience that will be around my place, around the site. All right, and I want. I'm going to think: Should I buy now or should I buy later? Should I skip on this deal, etc.? Because of the inconvenience, the noise the dirt pollution, noise pollution, and everything else. So now, in light of this, I believe the agent, it's in the, the onus is on the agent to tell the buyer, listen, there is construction due to start in this place for a complex, for a mall. I need to tell you this so that you are aware of this because it, it may affect your buying decision positively or negatively. Now, if I went to court, I would say, no, listen, I have to live with noise for for 20 hours of the day. And I was not warned about this. I was not told about the noise, the construction, the pollution and all this stuff. Roads being blocked. People have having to use back roads to get into the complex, et cetera, et cetera. I think I could use that argument against the agent. I, I sort of agree, but now my other point is, if that agent received the mandate from the seller, and tomorrow night I'm going to show you a, a document that we complete with our OTPs, where the seller must declare what is wrong on the property, on his property. Now, obviously, uh, if... Um, the wrong is not on the property, but in the area. Uh, I assume it must also be on that list. If you can, if the agent can prove he doesn't know, and the owner proves that he didn't know, then the owners will be like you said. The agent was supposed to uh, to get the knowledge from somewhere. Yes. But now my other question is: you as a buyer also run around and this might not be your first property that you've seen so through your viewings of a few properties maybe you went out with three four agents already uh nobody told you about a new shopping center gonna come up because it's an advantage if it's a shopping center and you are in the vicinity not neighboring but in the area yes uh, so, my question is, isn't, aren't you also as a buyer neglected? If it's a development land, then I will say you will not have an, a, 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 a right to fight it because we've got a due diligence period worked in our contract where you as the purchaser must do a proper due diligence uh, make sure that all the information is what you want, the marketing study and whatever the case may be. But in this instance, it's a house that you're selling. I think if you are an agent and you're working in that area for a long time, you will know it and then you will have a, a case. But if it's a new agent, I'm not so sure. Because there's no clause in the contract that force the agent to disclose. Okay. Rina, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, okay. we always we always look 
at the development of a mall as a positive thing in, in an area, in a region to attract business, to boost the value of the area, etc. But what about when this, for example, mall turns out to be a flop? I'm trying to think of cases in SA where malls have not turned out very good for areas. They've become maybe um, areas of crime. Um, they've maybe brought dirt to the area and bad traffic and um, things like that. Can you can can someone fight an agent and say, "Look, but I was not told of this development, etc." Unfortunately, not. Um, there is yeah. a, a similar um, uh, uh, development in Pretoria North, uh, North Park Mall. I think most people know that one. North Park Mall was one of the first uh, developments, uh, uh, um, like a shopping centre in this whole area. And after that one, Wonder Park came. And after that one, Wonderboom Junction came. Then Wonder Park was upgraded, and there was a, there's a new shopping centre now, also next to Wonder Park. So North Park Mall is dead, really dead. Now what happened now is that the developers and the owners of that time sold the development, and the new developer is now going and is changing it over instead of um, three, four floors of commercial. He's doing two floors commercial and the rest the residential. So that de development can turn around to be an, an advantage in another way for the right developer. Okay. Does that sort of answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you, Rina. Okay. Any more questions? Joyce, don't be shy. You and us? Okay. Prohibition against undue influence by estate agents. Prohibition against undue influence by estate agents. No estate agent shall, without good and sufficient cause, influence any party to a pending or a completed transaction to utilize or refrain from utilizing. The services of any particular attorney, conveyancer or firm of attorneys. The services or financial assistance offered by any financial institution to members of the public in general or the financial assistance offered to such party by any person. Now, this is very, very important. Um, if we just take clause 7.1, say for instance, you've got an attorney friend and he tells you now, okay, he'll pay you a thousand rand for each deal that you referred to him. If it happens that that attorney does not meet the requirements of the seller, because re remember, a, a registration attorney gets appointed by the seller or even the purchaser, then they can turn around. Say, for instance, that attorney got sick and he couldn't finish the transaction in time and there's a delay. Uh, the seller uh, reckons that he lost money and the transaction was not registered timely or what the case may be. They can actually turn around and sue you because you referred them. So if you refer an attorney or any uh, party, you must be very, very discreet and know who you refer so that you know that person can actually deliver the service that you are offering to your clients. Financial institutions or assistance. Remember, we are not a, 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 a financial service provide, uh, provider, a FSP. You are not allowed to do that. Yes, if somebody, uh, a, a client asks you, what will my repayment be? That's financial. What we do is, um, I will give that to you as well, is Uber. 
www.co.za. I think most of you know Uber. It's an app, a calculator from Uber. Now, Uber is a financial service provider. They offer a service. They do the bonds. And then the client can look on that app exactly what the uh, figures will be. And that covers you up. If you do the calculation like we did uh, years ago, they trained us how to do the calculations. I never use it ever again. Uh, I, I rather use the app because it covers you that you, if there's a figure that's not correct, because some attorneys ask what they want to ask in the framework, a thousand rand up or a 5,000 rand down, something like that, but then you are not liable for any difference. Because it did happen in the past where the agent give uh, work the cal calculated and the figure were wrong, and then the purchaser just said, but you tell me the registration fees are going to be 5,000. Now you see it's 6,000. You must now buy that 1,000. That happened. And then the agent is liable. Uh, so we try to step away from that. Uh, and unfortunately, that forms part of the uh, Consumer Protection Act. Any questions? Because this one is a bit heavy. Remuneration of estate agents. Now the commissions. Oh my word. You will hear, everybody tells you, you your agents are making money and you are getting paid so much. You must remember one thing as an estate agent. You will list 10 properties, you will sell one property. You, but in the meantime, you must work on all 10 properties. You will take clients out to all 10 properties. You will do advertising for all 10 properties. Uh, everything must be paid for the all 10 properties. So if you work out your time, what is your value of your time and how much money you really make, then I can assure you the 7.5% is not much. You will get around 3% in your pocket, 25 to 3%. And that is the honest truth. I'll get those figures during the training sessions. I'll give it through to you so that you can see how, how it's calculated. We are not allowed to receive any commission arising from any contract or lease which is subject to a suspensive condition. Now, uh, the, the new Consumer Protection Act uh, say clearly that we are not, although we earn the commission as soon as all suspensive conditions has been met, we are not allowed to take that commission or request that commission prior to transfer. Because the date of transfer is actually the change of ownership and, they, we, and at that time commission is payable. Sometimes if, has, if all documentation has been signed and guarantees has been delivered and what we call is the transaction is safe, uh, yeah, then so there is companies that uh, broke your commission on a fee. Uh, they are not cheap uh, and that's for a short period of time. But even them are getting very, uh, uh, I will say, ridiculous on the commission side. Uh, because their risk is quite big and high. And remember, any financial institution can, prior to date of transfer and even on the date of transfer, cancel that bond. And it actually happened to me once where a bond was cancelled while the attorney was on his way to the deeds office to sign off for that day for registration. And the bank just cancelled the bond and then you can't do anything. Also, no estate agent shall res a resolution condition during the time that the transaction may fall away as a result of the operation of the set resolutive condition, provided that the foregoing shall not apply if good cause exists, the party liable for the payment of the commission has expressly consented in a written document executed independently of the contract in question to such payment at any time 
notwithstanding the fact that the said contract is subject to a suspensive or resolutive condition, as the case may be. And such document contains an explanation of the implications on and financial risk for such party of such payment. And such document is signed by such party and the estate agent in question. How it works in practice, yeah, they say that uh, the, the party liable for the payment of commission must sign and give approval. In practice, the attorneys request both parties, the buyer and the seller, to sign and give permission to that. And it's only when there's a deposit. Now, the deposit is also, you must remember, the deposit is the money. That money belonged to the purchaser till the date of transfer. Prior to date of transfer, the seller cannot claim any of that money or use that money for the agent's commission. You still happy? So quiet the other side. Um, Rina? Yes, Mr. Dishu. We're good. Uh, I just want to um, find out I've had a, an issue. I think it was um, last year sometime where yeah. um, I was looking into buying a property and together with the seller and um, the estate agent, um, we decided on a term of buying it off uh, eight months period. So we were paying yeah. monthly um, fees that was uh, drafted together with the attorneys and the agent. And then seven months down the line, we decided to, to pull out of, of, of the deal. Um, in a contract they had a penalty fee for the seller because uh, I think we had put him, we had put his property out of uh, the, the the market for that seven months, and uh, there are attorney fees also. I think for opening the file and so forth, and then the estate agent also um, they didn't put anything at the time, uh, but uh, towards the end when we decided to cancel, they 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 requested that we pay them something. Um, yeah, unf unfortunately, any contract, any any contract, uh, if you cancel uh, any for any other reason than the suspensive condition, then you will be liable for exactly what you say now for because you take yeah. the property out of the market. Just put yourself in the in the seller's position. Uh, now you must start going back and start marketing all over. And I can assure you that uh, you will see now when you become an estate agent, when you start marketing a property, it actually takes about a minimum of three weeks to really touch the market and, and yeah. get people to come and view the property. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I can understand in that instance, that contract it's in the 1981 con uh, 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 Act, Property Act. And that specific act was not cancelled with the new Consumer Protection Act, and it does not fall under the new Consumer Protection Act. So they will have the right to do what they've done. No, um, I understood the attorneys and the, 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 the sellers. I'm, I'm just saying for now, for me now, when I'm doing this course, is it safer uh, for me as an agent as well to put a percentage? Should it, should it yeah. do not go through? Because they didn't at the time. No, I, I don't know how did they manage then to claim the commission. Maybe the commission was on a separate addendum that you haven't seen as a purchaser. That can also be a case. But uh, normally we say in that specific contract, uh, also, well, in any contract, but in that specific one, it says clearly that if the deal uh, fail or whatever, or um, maybe you go behind their back to purchase it uh, from directly from the seller, then they will be liable for a percentage of commission. Always. No. If his agent is involved, there must be a commission clause somewhere. I just think that maybe they've got a separate commission agreement with a seller. All right. Thank you. Because with our with our development land, uh, I if it's uh, the commission is big or you know, then we do a separate commission agreement. Because I always believe that we do not kill a transaction because of commission. Um, and if 
I must negotiate the commission with the seller again. And every time I must rush back to the purchaser to initial on the contract. So we want to keep our contracts clean, that we call it. And that's why we do an, a, a, a separate addendum, commission addendum. So if the seller agree or disagree, you can just change that addendum and it's only him signing there. All right. Thank you. Felicia, any more questions? Okay, and no agent shall convey to his client or any other party to a transaction in which he acted or acts as a state agent. Did I read this one? No. I did. No, you were just about to start with this page. Yeah, yeah. I just want to confirm. Okay, um, the agent convey to his client or any other party to a transaction in which he acted or acts as an estate agent that he is precluded by law from charging less than a particular commission or fee or that such commission or fee is prescribed by law. The board or any institute or association of estate agents or any... You can actually, on a normally residential property, uh, the norm is 7.5% plus VAT. We are not at format registered for VAT and we will also not, while I'm there, we will not register for VAT because that's a headache. And then you must st start charging VAT on your sales and um, it's not really worth it, I feel. Um, but you can, if, if you want, if the, say, for instance, the advertising price or the mandated price was one million with your commission. Now you manage to get a buyer, and this happens quite often. They call you on that one million. They will go out with you. They will look at the property. You will tell them it's one million. When you sit and you sign up that offer, they can say, "Now I want to offer eight fifty. So you, as an agent, have not done anything wrong, but. I always believe you take any offer that is given to you. So if that purchaser wants to offer 850, you try your best to up that price. But if they don't want to up it, write down that offer. Because remember, if he signed that offer to purchase with you, number one, he's not going to look at other properties because he wants this property. You, you, in, in a way, you can call it without doing anything wrong. You take him out of the market and keep him for yourself for a little while. On the other note, the seller, maybe he didn't play open cards with you. Maybe he's pressurized to sell this property very urgently. I always tell my sellers and at the somewhere during this uh, training, I'm going to tell you how do I negotiate a contract especially when it's a lower contract and believe me it worked every every time um so you go to the seller and you say to the seller mr seller you know i've told him it's one million and i tried to bring it up but this is the offer that he gave me you don't know i about 60 percent of my offers were accepted even if it's that low so yeah you don't know the real uh, uh, reason for selling he, he didn't play open cards or he can just tell you okay but I'll take 900 and then you can go back to the purchaser and say Mr. Purchaser you know what the owner is very uh, uh, keen to sell he's prepared to take 900 and then he will up with 900 so you you always sign that offer to purchase because you don't know the real outcome of that offer any questions to this Rina, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, I want to ask: Is it is it um, legal and ethical for an agent and a seller to agree not to go below a certain price? Let's say, for example, a property is is, is um the, the 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 buyer wants to sell for maybe a million. Sorry, uh, a seller wants to sell for a million, and. Um, now he knows he needs to pay the agent plus minus seven, seven and a half percent. 
Um, so he, the agent goes to the buyer and he says, you know what, in order for my commission to be in there and for you to get good money, let's agree not to go below a million. So we'll market the, the house for a billion 150 and we will not go below a million. So any uh, uh, buyer who comes will just tell them plainly that no, this house is worth more than a million and we can't go below a million. Is that legal? Is that ethical? The thing is that the property still belongs to the seller. And I think the seller has got the right to ask whatever he wants to ask, actually. But as an estate agent, it, it, you know, for me, if I want to list that property, we do a proper market study. If that market study shows that that price is in line with the market price in that area, then the owner, the seller will have the right to say, I'm not going to take anything less than an X amount. And that also uh, is for the, the um, auctions where you get a reserve price. The bank also will tell you, we will not take less than a certain amount. So, you know, it's not illegal and it's not unethical. Uh, but if you are an agent and you know that price is not negotiable, it's wise for you to tell your purchaser up front, even before you take him there, is that this is the price for this property, but it's not negotiable. And then it's up to the purchaser to decide. Okay. But... But I've, I've, a few times happened to me where I've just signed the offer to purchase. I write down what the, uh, the purchaser wants to offer. And then in most instances, the sellers are negotiating, will negotiate. If they are really in the market to sell and if they are keen to sell, they will negotiate. Irrespective of what the buyer thinks the yeah, the, yeah. the property is worth and how much they're willing to offer, negotiate maybe fifty thousand down or anything. Yeah. No, normally, I, I've seen quite often the, uh, the there is some kind of negotiation twenty to fifty thousand down. And you know what? As an estate agent, I hate cutting commission. Because I feel we, we offer, especially when you offer a professional service, uh, the medical doctors and the attorneys will not cut on their fees. Why must you cut on your fee? But maybe it's like, uh, you know, the commission can be like 150000 for in case. And you see you are going to lose this deal really with 30,000 rand. Then I will start negotiating with the seller and uh, 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 with my principal and to see if we can't uh, then a cut on the commission. So, Rina? Yes. So, is the, the, the agent the only one that takes a knock in this case? No, no, no. What you do, what I normally do, if they ask me to cut the commission, Say, for instance, the selling price was one million and they come down now with uh, 50,000. So it's 55%. Then I will take my commission, that's 150,000, and I'll say, okay, I will also take a 5% cut. Oh, okay. In real estate, you. You, the one thing that you will use your calculator the most for is percentages. All right. Any questions? Okay. Introduce a prospective purchaser or lessee to an immovable property or to the seller or lessee or thereof if he knows or has reason to believe that that such, such person has already been introduced to such a property or the seller or lessee or thereof by another estate agent and that there is a likelihood that his client may have to pay commission to such other or to more than one estate agent should the sale or lessee least be concluded through his intervention, provided that the foregoing shall not apply if the estate agent has informed his client of such likelihood 
and obtained his written consent to introduce such party to the property or the seller or lessor thereof. Now, I know that in some of the other training material, especially the one that Namisa was doing, uh, they say that it doesn't matter who introduced the property to the purchaser, uh, the, the agent who signs the offer to purchase is uh, the effective cause of the sale. In practice, I can tell you I disagree with it. If I'm taking a client out to a house and I'm introducing that client to that property, I introduce him to the seller, then if another agent insists to sign that OTP, I'm going to sue that seller for commission and there's a few cases in the court where the agent won the case and then the seller will pay double commission. It all depends on your mandate. Make sure your mandate is completed and properly uh, signed. Then you will. Then in that instance, you will be. Uh, you can claim commission. Any questions? Okay, no agent shall include any clause in a mandate or in a contract of sale or lease or of immovable property providing of payment to him by the seller or lessor of immovable property of any commission arising from a contract or sale, regardless of the fact whether the purchaser or lessee is financially able to fulfill his obligations in terms of the said contract. Uh, if you know this, um, maybe you've uh, uh, done an ITC check on the purchaser and you see that his, his debt looks very bad and you still go ahead and to sign that OTP and the seller signed the OTP and then that client didn't get money. At that time, that seller can actually sue you for uh, I'm, I'm what you call it, not loss of income, but you are taking that, that property out of the market. And that was deliberately done. So that's illegal. Provided that the foregoing shall not apply if the seller or lessor has prior to his signature of the contract or mandate, as the case may be, consented in writing in a document executed independently to the said mandate and contract to such payment and such document contains an explanation of the implications and financial risk for the less for the seller or lessor of such payment and such document is signed by both the estate agent and the seller or lessor include any clause in a contract of the sale or lease of immovable property negotiated by him entitling him to deduct from any money entrusted to him in terms of the contract any commission arising from such contract provided that a foregoing shall not be so constructed this is in short that you are not allowed to put a clause in to say that you can get your commission uh, from the deposit prior to registration or suspensive conditions have been made. Activity number 29, commission. Can the estate agent request that his commission be paid before the registration of the property? Can the estate agent take his commission from the deposit paid on the property? Can the estate agent arrange that the buyer pays his commission directly instead of waiting for the seller? Is anybody going to take a shoot on that one? Tandy? Masadishu, you can go. Yes. Um, number one, can the estate agent request that his commission be paid before the re registration of the property? Uh, I say no. I think yeah. for the reason that I've stated in the beginning that uh, maybe it can it can cancel. Yeah. Um, yes. Can the estate agent take his commission from the deposit paid on that property? I'd say no. He has to wait for 
and all the registration and everything to 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 happen before he can get the deposit. I'm just not sure on this one. Uh, can the estate agent arrange that the buyer pays his commission directly? Uh, it's a no because I think um, the the deposit is paid into the attorney's uh, account, so all the money is handled by by the attorneys, and that's where they get their their payment from. Okay, you are correct. Uh, I will just add in on number two. Uh, can the estate agent take his commission from the deposit paid on the property? Remember, the deposit stays the if we can call it the property of the purchaser. That's a purchaser's asset. And the purchaser is not paying your commission. So prior to date of transfer, that deposit belonged to the purchaser, not to the seller, and the seller is paying your commission. Yes. Okay. And can the estate agent arrive the buyer pays his commission directly? If the contract said the buyer is liable for the commission and the buyer is willing to pay the commission prior to transfer, then he can do so. But it's then his responsibility and if something happens and the deal doesn't go through, he cannot claim his commission back. If the seller is liable for the commission, why will the buyer then pay the commission? Because then it's just as if he's paying the commission from a deposit. Does it make sense? Because then that will form part of like a deposit. Any questions? Okay. Trust money and interest. Trust money and interest. An estate agent shall not solicit or influence any person entitled to trust funds. In the estate agents, in the agent's position or under its control to make over or pay to the estate agent directly or indirectly any interest on monies deposited or invested in terms of section 32.1 or 32.2 of the Estate Agents Affairs Act shall before he receives any money in trust and in respect of a contract or of sale or lease, disclose to the parties concerned that unless they agree in writing to whom interest earned on such money must be paid, the interest shall in terms of section 32.2 of the Estate Agent Affairs Act accrue to the Estate Agents Fidelity Fund. Shall if any money is invested by him pursuant to section 32A of the Act or pursuant to an instruction by the party entitled to the interest on money held in trust by the state agent. Now, in short, the interest on trust money. If you receive any interest on trust money, the, in your contract, either the sale contract or um, your uh, uh, if they put a deposit down for a purchase, uh, then you, the, your trust account gets audited once a year. Then your uh, banking fees can be deducted from the interest and the balance, 50% of the balance gets paid to the estate agency fees for trust funds. But you have an option there's the two options. Either you do it this way or you say that the, the uh, interest will be paid to the purchaser or to the tenant. Now, yes, if you are on the other side of the road uh, as, as the client, you will feel that you want the interest. I can assure you that with a low interest as it is now and uh, well, normally it's not more than 2.5% uh, if you deduct any other things, but what they can get out is about 2.5% average that you work per year. Because remember, that interest fluctuates. It's, today it's there, tomorrow it's down. 
we are not a financial institution, so we do not have the graphics to work out that percentage to the T to make sure that they get all their money. And if you want to do that, it's going to cost you more to do that calculation alone than not to pay him his interest. On the other hand, if you pay the, te the tenant or the client his interest, if uh, I'm talking about small money now, your big deposits is something different. Um, then if you pay him that, you are going to be liable for the banking fees on that account. And I can assure you that banking fees are not a joke. Um, you've got your monthly uh, uh, payment. What is it likely? 80 to 120 Rand on a trust account. Uh, it's not cheap on a trust account. So what I've done with, uh, when I had a business is that I said in my contracts, I'm not going to pay them the, the, the interest. The interest are rather paid to the Fidelity Fund uh, and then 50% of that can come to my company and that can help with all the banking costs and with whatever is needed as uh, marketing uh, money. And it's such a small amount, you, you cannot even go on holiday with it. Any questions on this one? Okay. Oh my word. No. Invest such money at the best interest rate available in the circumstances at the bank where he normally keeps his trust account or accounts. Okay, what I normally do, say for instance, we get a big amount uh, in for the purchase price. The guy wants to put down a 50,000 or 100,000. Then he sign a, a, a document where he requested us to invest the money for him, for his interest. Then, with that uh, for a, a, a document he completed and signed, I can then open an, another trust account, a subsidiary trust account under my trust account, but only specifically for this transaction. Then you put that money into that account. Any interest, up or down, all banking fees then gets automatically deducted at the end of the term when you must draw the money the bank will give you the bank statement what is the cost whatsoever and then you just give it to the purchaser and so this is your reconciliation on your uh, 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 deposit and deal is done or pay the full amount of the interest which occurred on the investment to the party entitled, we've talked about that, shall not include any clause in a contract of sale of immovable property negotiated by him. If you do not include a clause, then you have to pay him that uh, interest. That is the common law. Good cause exists. The purchaser has prior to his signature of the contract in question consented in writing in a document executed independently of the said contract to such payment and such document contains an explanation of the implications and financial risk of such payment for the purchaser and such document is signed by both the seller and the purchaser and the state agent in question. Any questions? Confidentiality by a state agent. No state agent shall, without just cause, divulge to any third party any confidential information. You know, if anybody walks into your office and requesting information, an attorney, even a police officer, doesn't matter. The only person who can walk into your office and uh, take your information is SARS, nobody else. Uh, you don't um, divulge any information to any third party. Okay, this is a legal uh, activity number 30, liability. It's an individual activity. What type of information would the estate agent be liable to keep confidential? Provide examples thereof. What does vicarious liability mean? How would vicarious liability apply to a real estate agency? 
that has several agents working for them. In the space provided below, draw a mind map of the most important aspects of the code of ethics. Ish, okay, individual. Who's going to try to shoot one? We can do three people. Victor? Who's here? Patricia, the Bochu. Yes, Rina, I'm here, but then I'm still digesting. <laughs> okay, try the first one because that is that can also, uh, with the new Poppy Act, apply to your uh, field as well. What type of information would an estate agent be liable to keep confidential? If I'm coming to you as a client and yes. now Alex comes to you and say, what client are you working with? Just supply me with a copy of their IDs. Be liable to keep calm. Uh, for example, the information that's on the... Um, that's on the offer to purchase maybe company information if maybe I'm purchasing it through a company. Well, well special, yeah, you're, yes, Sandy. Okay, maybe I was just thinking that um, could that be, you know, when the, the word confidential, obviously it has to do with your personal information, right? Um, yes. Pet lips, like you just said, someone walks in and then obviously they want someone else's um, uh, uh, personal information. So that could be your the IDs because of those are the things that someone obviously it's your personal information. Hence, once um, you you keep confidentiality between doctor and uh, patient, so I suppose with a, uh, estate agent, you have um, the ability, or you need to keep in mind that another person's personal um, information is very confidential. So, such as your IDs, pay slips, um, just the information that would give away to someone that would know certain things about um, someone. So I don't know, maybe I was just giving it a shot. <laughs> now, you are 100% correct. I always, even myself, I like when uh, my son's house was sold now, the neighbor called me and say, for how much did you sell your property? Now, it sounds like, uh, why, why not telling him? Uh, you know, it's information that might be good for him or maybe he can compare his house to this house. Uh, you know, it can be like a valuation. But in essence, it's still confidential because that price and that money relates to my buyer. And if he, uh, well, he was also, well, he isn't, was an estate agent. And he's, I said to him, but it's none of your business. He said, but I'm in any case going to see it. I said, yes, but then it's on date of transfer. It's your, then it's fine. Then, it's pub then at that time, it's public information. Because you can also have a risk. It's not only, be, uh, uh, you know, that you, you have to keep confidential in that sense. You must, all, confidential is actually very wide. We, what can happen is that agent might, for in case know that buyer, you don't know who he knows. And what if he turns around and tells that buyer, gee, but you know, you've paid too much for that property. Just because he's nasty, maybe you don't know what is going on in the market. What is the reason? So I feel any, any information on a transaction for me is confidential. But I think what they want here is what you said, the personal information. Now, who wants to tackle this number two, this difficult words?
Vicarious. Uh, I think I must actually putting um, the uh, what does it mean? The meaning of it there. Rina. Can you try it? The imagination through the feelings or actions of another person acting or done. Alex, um, can you I'll help us with that one? I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, basically, it's the responsibility that um, rests on on a on a principle or um, with the responsibility, the, the information. All right information or or um or what can i say responsibilities so if you go about being negligent and um you give out information or you don't carry out um your responsibilities um diligently i can i can sue you or charge you for for that yeah, you are you are hundred percent correct there, and I will add on to say that each agency must have a, like a FICA officer, where uh, the FICA officer must make sure that all the FICA documentation is up to date on the file and uh, legal. You agree with me on that one? Yes, I do. Okay. In this space provided below, draw a mind map. I don't think we're going to do that mind map now. I think you can even Google it. They will give it to you there. Okay. Uh, activity, public interest. A buyer makes an offer on a property. This one is just another one that I've put in there. Uh, a buyer makes an offer on the property through an estate agent. The agent... Now, I think we've done this one. We've done this one. Sorry. I think I didn't take it out. I didn't put it in the right place. Now, this was the, this is the full uh, code of conduct. But what I've done is uh, we are going to uh, go through contracts uh, further on in the uh, training session. I'm going to give you this. Um, I've worked this one out in the free course, but there's quite a few people here that was not at the free courses. So I'm going to to go fast through it and the reason is tomorrow evening I want to do the contracts as per se and um, we just want to compare the different types of contracts and what is um, relevant. Uh, the Bormats uh, intern agents will also join us tomorrow night uh, because for them part of their portfolio is they must now do contracts and I was thinking that can also be a good platform for them uh, and also you can then see what I'm doing for them at the estate agency company. So the types of contracts in real estate when it comes to leases uh, we will do tomorrow evening a lease mandate. I'm going to give you a template as well. A lease application, a lease agreement and an inspection sheet. Uh, we will also, uh, in that instance, look uh, exactly what is the act, what is the act say on uh, why must you do what uh, on those documentation. On the sales, you get the sale mandate, you get the purchases mandate, you get a sale agreement. Now, what we will do under a sale agreement. Uh, we will tell you exactly what is needed for an agreement. When, the, when can you say, yes, it is an agreement? And then the addendum on patent and latent defects. That is a very important document. And also uh, this one is uh, covers you as an estate agent uh, under the Consumer Protection Act. If that document is not there, uh, I can assure you uh, if the purchaser wants to be nasty, he can use any patent uh, defects and you, he can cancel the deal within two years period. A resolution, um, normally we do not do resolutions. Nowadays with the uh, companies, people are buying under name of companies, it's very important to have a resolution and the power of attorney to invest trust monies. Oh my word, like that typing error. Uh, trust monies. So uh, that we're going to do. 
So an agreement of sale is a written agreement. So any sale agreement must be in writing. You cannot do a verbal agreement. Uh, otherwise, it's not a legal and binding document. What makes a valid agreement? All parties concerned must reach a consensus. The parties concerned must have legal contractual capa capacities, meaning that you cannot sign with uh, a person under a certain age or even, you know what, so heartbreaking. If you are a pensioner, do you know that an estate agent cannot sign an agreement with a pensioner unless his children is signing with it? So a pensioner and an underage person uh, sing the same. Did you know that? Possibility of delivery. The seller must be able to deliver the property that has been sold to the buyer, meaning it must be a Pardon? Um, okay, then possibility of delivery. The seller must be able to deliver the property that has been sold to the buyer. Essential elements of an agreement of sale of immovable property are the parties, the purchase price, the method and time frame of payment, subject to uh, subject of the sale, and prescribed formalities. Agreement must be in writing. So there's only you must have the buyer and the seller, the purchase price, and how are they going to get paid, and the addresses, and the property description. That's all that needs to be in a, a, a sale agreement. You can, if you are forced and you do not have an offer to purchase with you, do it in writing and just write down those steps and that will be calculated as an offer to purchase. The clauses in an offer to purchase is countable as under the common law. You are supposed to know. A contract of sale need not be embodied in a single formal document. It can consist of two documents, the written and signed offer and the written and signed acceptance, as long as in both documents one refers to the other. There is no legal prohibition on concluding a contract of sale of immovable property on a Sunday. In South Africa, once you have signed an agreement to purchase a property, you cannot lose the property to a better offer made by someone else before registration takes place. If that OTP, you sign that OTP with a seller today and tomorrow he received another OTP with a higher price and he already accepted your OTP, he cannot accept another OTP. It's against the law. No stamp duty is payable on agreement of sale of land. What makes a valid offer? Blank spaces must be completed correctly and where they are not applicable, they must be deleted. If some material terms are left to be discussed later, the proposal is not a complete offer and acceptance does not create a contract unless it is clear that the matters still to be discussed are in fact immaterial to the contract. A letter to a seller from a prospective purchaser stating that he would like to purchase the seller's property at a particular price is not a valid offer. Neither is an invite with certain basic terms from a seller to a prospective purchaser on which the purchaser comments unfavorably considers the proposal. Any questions? An offer to purchase document must be signed by the purchaser the offer must be brought to the offeree, the seller's attention, either personally, telephonically, or by fax or by post. What makes a valid acceptance? The acceptance of an offer to purchase must be in writing and signed by the seller or his estate agent acting on his written authority. Acceptance must be clear and unambitious, not have two possible meanings. The offeree, seller's acceptance must be communicated to the offerer, purchaser, to conclude the, a valid contract. Now, say for instance, you emailed the seller the offer to purchase. How will you prove it's valid?
anybody wants to take a shoot on that? Um, I'll take a shot. Um, what makes an offer valid is the signatures. Yeah. If I have, if if I've signed the document, or if the purchaser uh, has signed the document and the seller signed the document, that makes it uh, binding and valid, isn't it? Yeah, but there's one other thing because now you must uh, remember, they say it must be in writing, and actually we are looking for the original document. The agent is keeping the original document that he's giving the attorneys and the parties a copy of the original document. But now you email it to him and he email it back to you, so you've got a, actually a copy. How do you make that copy a legal document as if it's original? Um, well, in this case, then um, you have the the... the the person, someone will have to fill out the original documents because they will have the information of the other party and date it. Okay. All right. But now you receive that document back, the contract, and it's complete, 100%, but it's a copy. It's not the original. How do you make that, that copy original? <clears throat> okay. I'll... I lay my guns here. <laughs> <laughs> Easy, you just can I tell you, Alex, you're gonna kick yourself now. You just put the, top, the email. That email, they email it back to you. So you print that email out and you attach it. Oh, okay. To the original. Yeah, and then it is as if it's original. Okay. <laughs> but we do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we do it all the time, but you don't think about it that way, me. Exactly. <laughs> no. uh, okay. Once the seller has signed the offer to purchase document, it is a legal and binding contract, and the purchaser need not to not be informed of the seller's acceptance for the document to be valid. The offer can only be accepted by the person to whom the offer is addressed or his duly authorized estate agent. Now, one thing that I have not put into this material is that the offer can also only be accepted by this owner of that property or a like what I had is I've got a power of attorney. But it must be a registered power of attorney, not just a letter. So, yeah, see, uh, um, and we often get that in, especially when there's a divorce case. Oh, my soul. That is a very sometimes a headache thing because either the husband or the wife decide now there's a divorce going on and they want to sell the property and then the other party does not want to sell the property either they are married especially when they're married in communal of part property there's always a fight it happens when they are outside community of property and you must also know there's laws uh, laws for this outside community uh, com uh, community of property as well so um yeah that is sometimes a headache. Make sure that both parties agrees to this to the selling of the property. And when it comes to the um, close to registration, so for instance, they did agree, and uh, there is an um, you know the properties the fund funding is in place, and the uh, registration is in process. Make sure that you get a copy of their uh, settlement agreement. Because the attorney can only pay their money according to the settlement agreement. Okay. And that's it. Why did we go so fast tonight? So tomorrow evening is going to be very interesting. Please, um, 
I think I'm, I really pray that there won't be any uh, load shedding. I'll also make sure that even if we've got load shedding, I'll have a backup system. Because we are really going to go through the contracts. Uh, what's up here is the mandates uh, or the different types of mandates. Uh, then also the lease agreements. Uh, also, what you must look out on lease agreements, that is uh, not there, actually the mandates. And so we are going to work through these documents. Um, I think it's very good to do it practically, because practical, you will um, actually see all the loopholes and what you must do or not must do. And as an estate agent, it's very important information to have. Any questions? Rina, please don't forget to also show us how to um, profile areas as we discussed yesterday. Yeah. yeah, so tomorrow evening, I think we are definitely going to do the three hour run. Uh, the profile areas, it's quite easy and uh, to do as well. So tomorrow evening will be a long session. So anybody in for uh, load shedding, Try to make get a backup system or something, please. Any other questions? Nothing. Is everybody still here? We are still here. Joyce? <laughs> yes. Joyce, are you still here? I'm still here. Okay, Numisa, do you have something that you can add? I see Dandy is also here, Dandy. Evening, Bruna. Evening, everyone. Uh, I no, Bruna, I think I think we covered, yes, I uh, know, I think we covered uh, everything properly today, so yeah, it went well, thank you. Okay, all right, then we will be here tomorrow evening, five o'clock, and yeah, I think it's going to be at least a three hour stretch, so um, I think we'll catch up what we lose tonight uh, on everything. Okay. So to, tonight is an early night and you can work on your activities. Andy? Yes, uh, thank you. greetings to everyone. Um, I think this was very um, helpful. Um, I can't wait to get to the more practical stuff. I think as a principal, we have decided that, ah, welcome Joyce. She has been complaining that she has been left out of this thing. So welcome. Uh, this is thank it. You. Thank uh, you. I hope you haven't missed much, um, but I'm hoping that you'll be able to still catch up. Um, Dandy, sorry, what can was I quickly say? interrupt? Dandy, can I quickly yes. interrupt? We've got three new uh, students tonight. Oh. Ah, okay. Yes, it is Joyce. Um, and Joyce? Uh, it is Joyce, and it is, I quickly want to. Uh, Tandy. Tandy, yes, Tandy, welcome. Hi. Tandy, is this the Tandy? Is this the Tandy we had on uh, entrepreneurship? Yes, it's me, Tandy. <laughs> ah, <laughs> how's Tandy? Yeah, gangster. Yes. Finally, I, I got you. to be here. Thank you. Yes. Ah, right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You and I still need to catch up. No, definitely, definitely, definitely. I think I spoke right. to most the last time, but then, yeah, definitely, we'll definitely do. All right, yeah. thank you. Yeah, there's a Martha as well, but I don't see Martha, or maybe she's got another name that I don't see. Okay, I think she didn't lock in. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there might still be a few people, it's a pity these things, 
people wait until someone else is in there and it's now up and running and they're like, ah, but then uh, it's not that they didn't know. I know that I am receiving uh, messages. Uh, hopefully people will still be able to catch up. Fortunately, all the things that we have are recorded. Uh, but as is this platform, why am I hearing myself now? Ah, okay. Um, so, yeah, I was saying that um, as it is, it's really quite exciting. There is still quite a, a, a few more people that might join who had expressed interest from back in the day. So don't get surprised if someone else come and you. There are those that um, uh, they think talking to me means that they, it's registration. Uh, always the case. Sometimes it helps, particularly, uh, but in reality, <laughs> you still need to go through Bridget or Mashiko. Um, there is an undertaking that on Wednesdays, for instance, last week we had a town planner. Uh, tomorrow we are going to be doing uh, practicals, which is based on um, uh, the logbook. Uh, we are all anticipating um, probably a slightly bigger number, uh, but some of those would be just visiting audience from Pomat side and all of that. Uh, fighting and we'll continue. Remember the idea of this program is really to say, let's create a really pragmatic uh, platform. And there's an African proverb that says, he who learns must teach. So we are hoping that uh, amongst yourself, the next group, the next crew, as you are uh, uh, um, enabling yourself, uh, getting empowered with both knowledge, you're able to really go out there and make miracles in the market. Um, I still regard real estate as one of the um, wealthiest um, value creators in property. I always give an example that I'm an architect, do a development uh, which cost 100 million rands, I will do that development over 12 months and I still get paid 10%. A real est an estate agent um, do that uh, in, uh, sell that building in three months and they still get the same 10%. Who made more money? Hmm? Real Mr. Jonas. Agent. Exactly. That's the secret that the real estate agency have heard for the longest of time. And unfortunately for the longest of time, it was a small clique of very well protected uh, group. So they, they, in the recent past, they've really blown that up uh, by introducing the property practitioners bill. On the one hand, uh, bringing it to the Department of Human Settlements. On the one hand, really making it a lot more accessible. But accessibility is still a debatable question because um, it might be accessible to you and me who speaks nice English here on Teams. Uh, there are real people who are having back rooms uh, who don't have any of this education or knowledge and they're still doing very well.